Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Lose, and I'm one of the instructors here with Dr. Al Kozlowski, uh, talking about longitudinal data analysis here at the American Congress of Rehab Medicine. Uh, we hope you're enjoying the workshop so far. Uh, in Al's section, he's been talking about more conceptual issues around building mixed effects models and how you can use them in longitudinal data analysis. In this section, we're really going to focus on the practicalities of running those analyses using the statistical pro programming language R uh, and the programming interface R Studio. Um, so you've been provided with these handouts. Um, and if you're familiar with R and R Studio, you might find it easy just to kind of go through the handouts um, you know, and run the code on your own. And you'll have kind of enough uh, uh, support to make that run really smoothly. Uh, if you're newer to R or you just want a little bit more information, the goal of these videos is to provide you with a little bit of extra scaffolding and a little bit of extra interpretation as you run that code. Um, so you'll have been provided with these handouts as well as the files, uh, the, the R script files uh, to actually implement this code. Um, and so you can just basically toggle back and forth uh, between um, your R interface and the handout. Uh, in order to, you know, actually implement the code, because we'll run a code chunk, you know, and then we'll talk about it, then we'll run the next code chunk, and we'll talk about it. Um, and so if you, if you, you know, uh, feel really comfortable with it, again, you don't necessarily have to watch the video because you have the handout. Um, but otherwise, I'll try to provide you with a little bit of extra information and a little extra interpretation. The other thing I will say here is if for whatever, whatever reason, when you're running these analyses on your own computer right now, and you encounter an error message, um, that's totally fine from like an R perspective. We're going to have some Zoom sessions for, for troubleshooting and discussion of some of those issues. So if you are hitting any technical hurdles, I would say just, you know, stick with the video and follow along because I'll be talking about the interpretation of all of these elements of the code. So even if you hit a technical problem on your end and you can't recreate what's being done here, we can figure that out in the troubleshooting session later. And then for the, the, the purposes of the video right now, you'll at least be able to see the interpretation and everything else that goes into it. So to start with, um, you know, let, let's just focus on the parts of this handout. So I'm going to provide you with some text. Um, and so that gives you uh, an explanation in the different sections. And then the areas that are presented in gray are little code chunks in R. Uh, and so those correspond to what you see if you have the R markdown file open here. Uh, so to run those little code chunks, you can just press the, the run button here. Um, and then you can see that it will actually implement that code down here in the console window. So in this first case, we're just opening up the libraries. So there's nothing really much that happens there. Um, if you have not installed these libraries on your computer before, you're going to need to actually go ahead and skip down to this second chunk and install those packages. Um, and again, if the uh, installation of packages in the opening of libraries sounds unfamiliar to you, uh, we did send a link to a video before the workshop. Uh, to kind of walk people through how to do that and, and how to do that in our studio. So you can go back and revisit that video now or, or sometime in the future if you feel a little bit uncomfortable with that. The other thing I will say is if you uh, don't actually like looking at this in the R Markdown interface and you actually want to run this code on your own, what you can always do is create a script file. And then inside of that script file, you can just copy the R code chunks um, and, and put them in your script file here. So for instance, the next thing that we're going to do right down here under data cleaning and quality assurance is actually run the code to import the data. So in our markdown, I can click that run and you'll see it'll run all the way through. And then I've successfully created this object called data up here in my, in my global environment. And for the purposes of, you know, kind of following along with the workshop, that's all you would need to do. But if you wanted to create your own script file, you know, that doesn't have my comments and it doesn't have the other texts or any of the other markup language around it, all you would need to do is copy that code, you know, bring it over here. And now in your own script file, you can run that code. Uh, so I'll click run and you can see, you know, it's imported the data file and we're looking at the top uh, using the head function. We're looking at the first uh, six rows of all of the columns that are in that data file. Uh, so these are the data that we're going to be working with uh, in, the, in the module. Uh, and to show you kind of in this columnar arrangement, right? we've got a column for subject IDs, we've got a column for the month for these longitudinal data that were collected over time. Uh, we, and month is coded in integers, but we also have a time variable that tells us you know, specifically when uh, those data were recorded. Uh, you know, we have the hypothetical sex of these subjects, hypothetical BMIs, 
Uh, but then most importantly, we have Roche scaled FIM scores, because what we're going to be looking at is how the Roche scaled functional independence measure for these hypothetical spinal cord injury subjects changes over time. Uh, so we have one column that's uh, Roche FIM, and that's going to be our primary dependent variable and everything we're working on uh, until you get to the very end uh, where we're going to provide you with some extra information about missing data. Uh, and in the missing data lectures, we're going to have a few different variations of this dependent variable. So we'll have Roche FIM missing at random, or MAR. We'll have Roche FIM missing not at random, or MNAR. Uh, and Roche FIM with the last observation carried forward, where we've uh, filled in those missing values with the last available observation. So again, those, those three columns will be dependent variables that we'll worry about later. Uh, but for the bulk of what we're going to do, we're going to look at these Roche scaled FIM scores and see how they change over time. Uh, and let me toggle back to the worksheet, uh, because that's going to be the easiest way to visualize some of this stuff. But again, you can flip back and forth, running the code in R, coming back to this worksheet. And if you have any technical R questions, uh, please bring them to the Zoom uh, workshop uh, uh, com component where you can ask those questions live. But once we have those data imported, we're going to use the ggplot function um, in order to build up a plot where we take those data uh, and we're going to look at month on the x-axis and Roche scaled FIM scores on the y-axis. Um, and then the other elements of this code I won't really get into, but it's going to allow us to add lines and points to the plot that we're creating in order to visualize the Roche scaled FIM scores over time. So here you can see the, 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 the plot that that code generates. Um, and this shows us our Roche scaled FIM scores on a scale from zero being a complete lack of independence to 100 being complete independence uh, as a function of time, which goes from one to 18 months for our three different groups where we have individuals who have a C1 to four spinal cord injury, a C5 to eight spinal cord injury uh, and individuals who, uh, who have paraplegia. So what we want to do is try to understand how can we model these data longitudinally, right? Because if we just fit a regular regression to these data, we're going to run into a problem where our residuals are not independent of each other because different observations come within a person over time. So the traditional general linear model is going to break down here, right? And the idea that we can't just fit a one time variable to all these observations and treat these observations as independent. However, this overall kind of notion of that, you know, our data is equal to some statistical model plus the residual error still applies. Um, so yeah, you can read through, you know, the handout in more detail, um, but what we are going to do is use random effects in addition to the fixed effect of time in order to account for that statistical dependence in the data. And there are a few different ways that we can do that, uh, as you might recall from the conceptual lectures this morning. One would be is that we could put just a random intercept in there. So for each person, they're going to get a unique deviation away from the group level intercept. Uh, and that allows the line for each person to start in a different place, but everyone's going to have the exact same effect of time. Getting a little more complicated, we can have both a random intercept and a random slope which would be represented by uh, this model here, uh, where you can see we have group level effects for the intercept and, and the slope represented by the betas, but we also have individual deviates away from those slopes and intercept represented by U0J and U1J. You can I'm kind of like rearranging the terms here to make it a little bit more clear, but you can see that, okay, for each person then, they start with the group level intercept and they have some deviate either up or down that determines their intercept. And then they have a group level slope and they have some deviate either up or down that determines their unique slope. And by having a random slopes, random intercepts model, we will now be able to estimate a unique trajectory for every person. Um, and then we will get residual errors based on how they deviate away from their lines. And conceptually, that is what's being shown with the code here that generates this figure. So we're looking at Roche scaled FIM scores from zero to 100 as a function of time going from one to 18 months. Uh, and you can see that the dots and these lines are color coded to reflect the individual subjects. So let's, for instance, look at this green person here. And you can see that this person has a much lower intercept than the group level intercept, right? So they have a random effect so for their own intercept. Um, their slope is actually 
pretty parallel uh, to the group level slope. So they wouldn't show much of a difference in their random effect because they are pretty close to the average slope um, within this group. Um, but what you can see further though, is that even though we have a unique slope and intercept for this person, there are still deviations away from that line. Um, and we tend to have you know, some negative residuals at the beginning, more positive residuals in the middle, and more negative residuals at the end. Um, so we, we have a unique slope, a unique intercept, and a set of residuals for each person. Uh, and you can see that represented by the different colored lines here. The thick black lines represent the group level trajectories, and the thin colored lines represent the trajectory for each individual person that you would get if you took that group level beta and added the subject level U, right, that random effect to it. So by adding the fixed and the random effects together, you can get the unique coefficients for each person. So these are the key components of our model. We have fixed effects, which determine the group level trajectories. We have random effects that determine the individual deviations away from those trajectories. And we have the residual errors or random errors, which are the difference between each individual data point and the unique trajectory estimated for each person. Uh, we're gonna spend a lot more time on each of these things as we move forward. Um, but you know, if this is unclear, I think it's really helpful to kind of go back at this point and maybe look at some of the slides that Al presented or look at some of the more detailed explanation in the text that I've presented to make sure you feel comfortable with the conceptual distinction between fixed effects, random effects, and residual errors. And if you have any questions about those things, be sure to bring them to the Zoom you know, live Q&A that we're, we're going to be doing. So next, our model definitely does not look linear. If you were looking at those uh, uh, plots earlier, you might've said, well, okay, I get the random slopes, random intercepts, but it doesn't really look like linear change. In fact, it looks like there's kind of a curve to that line where people show uh, greater change early on and they show less change later. And you're absolutely correct. In looking at these figures, it certainly doesn't look like a straight line is gonna be the best description of our data because uh, there seem to be diminishing returns in these FIM scores over time. And we're gonna deal with different ways of, of, uh, of the, handling this nonlinearity as we move forward. In the advanced session in the afternoon, we're actually gonna talk about truly nonlinear models. Um, but for now, we're gonna focus on curvilinear models that use polynomials to make our lines curve. So a curvilinear cre model creates a curving line, but it is linear in its parameters, which is to say, you know, we can have time and we can have time squared but the parameters of beta zero, beta one, and beta two just get added together, right? So they are linear in their parameters. We might have a unique slope for the effect of time squared, but it just gets added to the value for the linear effect of time, which gets added to the intercept to ultimately determine the value of y at each point in time. So curvilinear functions can approximate those sorts of curves, um, but again, they are linear in their parameters, which makes them distinct from truly nonlinear functions. So for instance, a, a negative exponential function like this one is something we'll deal with in the advanced class. Um, and you definitely can fit a mixed effect model that is nonlinear, um, but curvilinear models are a really good place to start uh, uh, because people are generally more familiar with regression that uses polynomials than they are with negative exponential functions or with regression splines or some of those kinds of things. So we will get into truly nonlinear models in the advanced session, but for now, let's just think about creating a curvilinear model. Uh, and we'll plot that visually, again, using some ggplot code. And as always, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but the thing I do want to specify here is that we're adding a smoothed function uh, using the stat smooth argument. And you can see I'm speci specifying a particular formula for the stat smooth. And for this first one, we're gonna do it for each subject. So I'm clustering them by the color based on their subject ID number. And then for each person, I'm gonna estimate y as a function of x plus x squared. And then my second stat smooth is actually going to create a smooth line for each group. So the first one's doing it at the subject level, the second one's doing it at the group level. But again, you can see that I'm specifying a formula where y is equal to x plus x squared. Uh, and that's what's ultimately gonna generate a plot like this one where I have curving lines. So in this situation, I would actually be estimating a random intercepts, random slopes model. Uh, and not only do I have linear random slopes, but I have quadratic random slopes. Um, so I would refer to this as the quadratic random slopes model. 
visually that's what we're trying to uh, present here because you can see in each group we're going to have group level effects that tell us okay on average you know how where do people start that's the intercept how much does their line tilt that would be the linear effect of time and then how much does their line curve and that would be the quadratic effect of time and we're going to have random effects for each of those things the intercept the linear effect of time and the quadratic effect of time because that's going to allow people to start in different places relative to their group that would be the random intercept it's going to allow people to have a different tilt relative to their group that's the random linear effect and it's going to allow individuals to have a different curvature relative to their group. And that is the random quadratic effect. Uh, and you can see just visually having that random quadratic effect greatly reduces the residuals. We're getting a much better fit to everyone's data here um, than we were in the purely linear model if you scroll back up to that random slopes model. So the, the, the formula for this definitely is starting to get a little more complicated. Right, but just to put the formula and the figure on the screen at the same time, right? We, we're just adding one extra component. This is still a random slopes model, but what we have is a, a fixed effect for the intercept, the linear effect of time, and the quadratic effect of time. And then complementing each of those, we have a random effect of the intercept represented by a U, a random effect of the slope, and a random effect of the quadratic slope. Um, so we're going to get a pretty customized, personalized line here for each person, and we're getting a much better bottle fit, but you can see it's at the expense of making a much more complicated model. And these are always the things that we're going to have to balance against each other. How well does the model fit versus how complicated is that model? So next, we want to decide which of these models, which of all the possible models that we want to build is actually the best explanation, right? Conceptually, I hope you feel pretty comfortable with what the fixed effects are, what the random effects are, what the residuals are. And now we really need to think about model building and model comparison. So how are we going to build a random intercepts model? How are we going to build a random slopes model? And then how can we use R in order to compare them statistically? So we're gonna start with our random intercepts model because that is computationally the simplest and it's essentially gonna be our benchmark for what is the simplest model we can fit to these data. Any, any added complexity then has to be better than that model. Because if we add a variable and it doesn't explain things better than the random intercepts model, that variable is not very good and we probably don't want it in there. So let's start with our uh, random intercepts model where for each person at each time, we're just going to estimate a group level intercept and an individual difference away from that intercept. Um, and then we're going to fit that and see how much error there is in our data. And our goal is going to be to see, well, how small can we get this error? And this model is so simplistic, we probably won't reduce the error very much. So one thing that I'm going to do before we, we do this is I'm going to create a variable called year.0, where I'm just taking months, and months started at 1. So I'm going to subtract off 1 in order to have months start at 0. And then I'm going to divide by 12 to convert months into years. And the reason for doing that is twofold. First, I want it to start at 0. So the intercept is really the first observation that we have, because our observations actually started at 1 month but I want them to start at time zero. So I'm gonna subtract one. I also want to scale the slope to make it a little easier to interpret. So rather than having um, you know, months uh, zero or one to 18, right? I wanna scale this to years and the years uh, will now go from zero to 1.5, right? So rather than dealing with zero to 18 months, I wanna deal with zero to 1.5 years. And by scaling that time variable, that helps me avoid some potential convergence issues, especially as we add interactions into the model. Then the, here's the R code for actually implementing that model. So we're going to create an object called random effect intercepts, right, or ranf int, uh, using the LMER function. And inside of the LMER function, you want to specify what your dependent variable is, uh, and then you'll use this tilde, which tells you as a function of uh, and then you can tell it what you want to predict that dependent variable as a function of. Uh, I've added some comments here just to help keep it cleaner and you can see the, the, the effects a little more easily, but you don't actually need to have those comments in there. If you want to have this all in one line, 
uh, and that makes more sense to you, the code will totally work that way. Um, I just like breaking it up in this way so that you can see, okay, well, what are my fixed effects? And then what are my random effects? So in this random intercepts model, the only fixed effect I have is this intercept, right? There's a group level intercept for everyone. And the only random effect I have is an intercept within each person, right? So this is an intercept conditioned on the subject ID. So everybody is getting their own intercept in this model. So uh, the, I have a fixed intercept and I have a random intercept, right, for each subject. Um, and that's going to essentially allow me to fit a very simple model uh, to the raw scaled FIM scores from this data set. So I have to tell the, the function where the data are coming from. And then finally, I have to say if I want to use restricted maximum likelihood or maximum likelihood. So REML is restricted maximum likelihood, and we're going to set that to false um, because we want to use maximum likelihood, not restricted maximum likelihood. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit more of why we use maximum likelihood in a, in a second. Um, but the, the, the short answer is, is that for deciding amongst models, we need to use maximum likelihood in order to do model comparisons. If there was one model that we knew we wanted from the beginning and we were just interested in kind of the statistical significance of the individual parameters, we could use restricted maximum likelihood. But right now, we're really interested in what random effects need to be in there. And in order to compare models with different random effects, we need to use maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, and you know, it, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that down below. Uh, but th that is a great question. If you want to bring it to the Zoom Q&A later, you know, we can talk more about the difference between restricted maximum likelihood and maximum likelihood. But for now, again, let's just run this R code in order to create our random intercepts model. Uh, and then once that is created, we can use the summary function to get all of the details of that model printed to the screen. So inside of that summary function, you can see it gives us a uh, kind of a restatement of what the model is. It's going to give us some model fit statistics up here at the top, including the Akaike information criterion, the Bayesian information criterion, the log likelihood, the deviance, and the degrees of freedom for the residuals. We're going to get into that in, in a minute. Right For now, I'm just telling you what those things are. Those are your model fit statistics. Uh, it also tells you about the scaled residuals, right? So kind of how far off are you on average when you're, when you're making these predictions. Um, that then gives us a summary of the random effects. Uh, and this is a component of the output we're going to be really interested in. Uh, so you can, you can see that it gives us, okay, the grouping factor, the name of the particular random effect, and then the variance and the standard deviation of that random effect. So you can, we have a random effect for the intercepts, right? And we have a standard deviation of 9.5 points. So that means on average, people differed from the group level intercept by about 9.5 points on the FIM. Below that, it then tells us about the residuals, right? And again, it gives us a variance and a standard deviation. And the standard deviation is about 13.27 points. So the residuals are saying, okay, we're estimating a group level line for the group, and we're estimating a line with a different intercept for each person. Now, how far away from each individual line do the data points tend to be? Uh, and people tend to be off their individual line by about 13 points. So those are pretty big errors, uh, suggesting we're not explaining the data very well. Uh, and that will be probably very apparent when we actually plot this model to show what this model is estimating. But that's kind of how we would interpret this, uh, this random effects output here. The other thing that is nice in that output is that it gives us a summary of the number of subject IDs and the total number of observations. And by looking at the total number of observations and how those observations are grouped, that can be really helpful for you understanding, uh, you know, were there any errors in your data? Because if those numbers don't add up or if they don't look like what you think they should, um, that's going to suggest that you know, something went wrong somewhere and you probably have to dig back into that and do a bit more troubleshooting. The final part of that output is the interpretation of the fixed effects. And in this case, it's pretty boring because it's just an intercept. Uh, and it's telling us that on average, right, people's intercept was 44.904. And that's not super informative, although it is statistically different from zero, as you can see from the p-value here. Um, but all that is saying is that kind of the average point across all these data, across all people, across time was 44.9. And people deviate from that point, 
but that is what the group level average was. So um, we're gonna, uh, there's some other R code where I, I show you how to kind of pull out the random effects and the fixed effects individually. Um, if you want, you can run that code in R to actually see what that looks like and get those observations out. Um, but the main thing that I'm going to do is use some of that information uh, to generate some plots. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to create a data frame called predictions, um, and then I'm going to fill that data frame with some information uh, based on those coefficients from the fixed effects and the random effects. Um, so that's a little more detailed just from like an R programming perspective than I want to get into uh, here. Um, if you know, if you do want to do that with your R code, again, you know, you kind of can come down to the appropriate place inside of the markdown document to where we fit that model. Um, and then where we're going to actually be extracting those results. So it's on line uh, 200 of the, of the markdown document. And again, if you're really interested in, in how I am doing this, I'm happy to, to kind of go through that with you uh, over email or, or during the Zoom Q&A. But for now, conceptually, just know that once we've built that model, I'm pulling out the unique effects for each person so that we can plot them. Uh, and the conceptual understanding is what's really key here. So I'm, I'm taking the first 10 subjects and I'm gonna plot their data. So those are the gray dots with you know, the black line connecting all their individual observations. And then I am plotting over the top of that as the red bars, the predictions from our random intercepts model. And you can see that those predictions are not very good, right? Because we're just predicting an intercept. It's a constant, so it doesn't change over time. We are predicting one value for each person now each person gets a different value, but it ignores any change over time. So even though people might start in a different place, right? You can see the difference between S05 and S04 or S04 and S03. It is not a good fit to the people's data, which is why those residuals were so large, right? So clearly there's some room for improvement here. So the next thing we're gonna wanna do is build a fixed slope random intercept model where we're gonna have that random intercept but we are gonna add in an effect of time. Now, this is a fixed slope though, which means that time is going to be the same for each person. So to do this in R, I'm gonna create a new model called RANF slope, uh, and I'm gonna use the LMER function, where again, we'll be looking at Roche scaled FIM scores as a function of a intercept, right? That's the one, and time, which is our year dot zero variable. So we're gonna put that in here, uh, as our fixed effects. However, at the moment, the only one we want to vary between people is the intercepts. So we'll include a random effect of subject ID. So we'll get a random intercept for each person. And again, we have to tell the LMER function what data it's coming from, and we're going to use maximum likelihood estimation. Once we fit that model, we can use the summary function to get the output printed to the screen, and it would look like this. So again, it's gonna tell us what model it was fitting, it's gonna give us our model fit statistics. It's gonna give us a summary of the residuals. And then it's gonna give us our explanation of the random effects. And our random effects uh, here uh, look the same in terms of that we have a random intercept for subject and we have residuals, but you'll notice that the values change some. So our, our standard deviation for the intercepts is about the same. People's intercepts are still about nine points away from the group level intercept. But by including the effect of time, you can see that we've cut the residuals down by almost half. It went from a value of about 13, right, for the standard deviation of residuals to a value of 6.6. .6. So we're getting a much better explanation of the data by allowing our model predictions to change over time. Um, and if you wanna know, well, how much did they change over time? We can look at the output for the fixed effects, where now we have both an intercept, right, which was 26.58, so that is to say at time zero, at the very beginning, the average raw scaled FIM score across everyone was 26.58. But we also now have a slope for year dot zero, which was about 25.85. And that was statistically significant, right? Given the p-value here. Uh, and what that's saying then is for a one point increase in the X variable, which in this case is time in years. So for a one year increase, we expect Roche scaled FIM scores to go up by about 25.8 points. So at the beginning of the study, on average, people started by about 26, 
And by the first year, people changed on average by about 26 points as well. So there's definitely a positive slope in these data. And again, I'm gonna use some R code to pull out the individual uh, uh, coefficients um, in order to generate a plot. But conceptually, our goal is to understand what is that fixed slope random intercept model doing? And you can see that plotted for the first 10 subjects here. Again, the, dot, the gray dots connected by the black lines of the individual subject data. The red lines are the predictions from our model. And we have a random intercept in this model. So everyone's line starts in a different place, but we have a fixed slope. So everyone has exactly the same slope because we did not allow the slope to vary within individuals. So you can see that that's a better approximation of the data, but it's still not great. And especially early on, we seem to be missing a lot of the change in Roche scaled FIM scores based on our linear slope. So the next sort of level of complexity we can add here is to say, well, rather than giving everyone the exact same slope, what if we created a random slope, random intercept model? So again, showing the mathematically what that would look like, right? We're gonna have a group level intercept that varies by each person. And we'll have a group level slope that varies by each person. Um, in our terms, we're gonna create a model, which I'm gonna call random effect linear random, right? So, so, so this is a, uh, that we've got a random effect on the linear slope. We're gonna use LMER. We're gonna be modeling Roche scaled FIM scores as a function of both an intercept and time, right? Represented by our year dot zero variable. But now in our random effects, I'm gonna include a random intercept for each person and also a random effect of time. So not only will everyone start in a different place, but their slope will tilt, right? Differently, depending on which person you are. And then finally, we can print those random effects to the screen uh, and we'll get an output much like we've seen before where we had uh, our, our, our model fit statistics, our scaled residuals, and then an explanation of our random effects. And that random effects output is getting more complicated here um, because now not only do we have a standard deviation for the intercepts to tell us how much people differed from the group level intercept, we also have a standard deviation for the slopes to tell us how much people differed from the group level slope. And on average, right, people uh, were typically seven points above or seven points below the group level slope. We had a standard deviation of about seven points for those slopes, suggesting that people vary pretty significantly in their trajectories. The other additional piece of information that we get here is the correlation between the random effects. So not only do we see the standard deviations for the individual random effects, we see how they are correlated. Uh, and in fact, these tend to be positively correlated uh, such that people who have higher deviates for the intercept uh, also tend to have uh, higher deviates for the slope. So people who had a higher starting position also tend to change more linearly over time, whereas people who had a lower starting position tended to change less linearly or, or be flatter over time. Now, we can also look at our residuals to get kind of a general sense of how well this is fitting our data. Uh, and it's gone down, you know, it's, it had, it's gone down from about 6.6 .6 points with the fixed slope to about 5.8 points with the, with the random slope. So, you know, it's not a huge improvement, but it definitely is a statistical improvement where this model is giving us a better explanation of our data. Again, you can see that we're gonna have um, fixed effects for both the intercept and the uh, slope. Uh, and both of these things are statistically significant. You'll notice that their um, estimates didn't really change from, from the, uh, the, the random intercepts model. But one thing I do wanna point out is that when we include the random effect for the slope, the degrees of freedom go way down here. Uh, it, it started at something like 630, right? And now we have a degrees of freedom of 40. And obviously those things are very different. So I did want to talk a little bit about, you know, well, what does that mean when you include that random effect for the slope? Um, when we had just the random intercepts and a fixed slope, we were esti estimating one line and then treating all of the data points, right, essentially as contributing to that line. Um, when we add a random effect for the slope, what we're saying is there's not one overall slope that goes through this cloud of data points. What we really have is a series of slopes for each person. And then what we have, because we have 40 people, are 40 different slopes that we can compare, right? It's not one slope being fit through several hundred data points, 
it's one slope being fit through 40 data points, then one slope being fit through the next person's data points, then one slope being fit through the next person's data points. And then we, at the end, we have 40 slopes. And so we have a random sample of slopes, right, is how we are treating this variable now. And that reduces the degrees of freedom. Um, so the, the, you know, exactly what the correct denominator degrees of freedom here are um, is, is an important question. And, and, you know, there are some debates about kind of the best way to actually handle this. But the thing I want to impress upon you is that your choice of the random effects can make a big difference in your model. And so conceptually, you want to be thoughtful about which random effects you're including and which random effects you are not including. Uh, and you can't just, for instance, throw a random effect of subject in there and assume that all the statistical dependency is removed from your data, because what you might risk doing is inflating your degrees of freedom, which makes your type one error rate a lot higher. So you want to be careful with that. And conceptually, right, I think it's a good practice to think about, well, I've got 40 people. They all have a unique slope. I probably want that random effect of slope in there. Now, you, you certainly can test a random intercepts model that has a fixed slope. Um, but, but theoretically speaking, um, that doesn't really make sense. So it's a stepping stone to kind of see, okay, well, how much error do we explain as we add complexity to our model? But realistically, we probably want that random effect in there um, because the slopes do vary from person to person. Even if they vary a tiny amount, conceptually, we probably want that random effect of the slopes in there. Now, again, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling out the coefficients uh, from that, that model to actually generate a plot that shows us what's happening here. Um, but what we're gonna get is a uh, random slopes model where now you have the red lines for each individual person that differ not only in their intercepts, right, but they also differ in their slopes. So you can see that for instance, subjects 04 and 09, they tended to have quite low intercepts they also tend to have much flatter slopes, whereas subjects 0, 2 or subjects 0, 8 had much higher intercepts and they tend to have much steeper slopes. So you can see across those first 10 subjects, we're estimating different slopes and intercepts for each person. And there is also a correlation between those slopes and intercepts such that people who started out higher tend to have steeper slopes as well and they show a greater rate of improvement. Okay, so finally, right, we, we've also talked about the nonlinearity in this model. Um, so what we can do is get a quadratic random slopes model where we're gonna allow the line to bend by adding a quadratic effect here of year squared um, to, to our model. And we will allow that to bend differently for each person. So we're gonna also add a random quadratic effect to our model. So we, once, we, once we run that model, right, and we create ran f quad rand, we can use the summary function to see a detailed output of that model. Uh, and as before, right, it's gonna give us our model fit statistics and our scaled residuals. Uh, and then we're going to get our uh, random effects table, which is now getting much more complicated because now we've got random effects both for the intercept and the linear effect and the quadratic effect. Um, and we actually have three correlations now, because we have the correlation between the intercept and the linear effect, and between the intercept and the quadratic effect, and between the linear effect and the quadratic effect, which tend to be highly correlated. Um, now, in this case, the, 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 uh, the program didn't give us any warnings or errors, um, but really high correlations between your random effects can often lead to convergence errors. Um, and if your random effects are so correlated that it approaches one, right, essentially they're perfectly correlated, uh, you'll get a convergence warning. And it will usually say that there's a singularity or, or you've hit a boundary in your estimation. Uh, and conceptually, one way we could interpret that is if these effects were so strongly correlated that let's say this correlation was actually negative one, I don't need the quadratic random effect in there um, because if I have the linear effect and the correlation is one, I already know what the quadratic random effect is. So essentially those things are determined and you don't need them both uh, in your model if that correlation saturates and goes to one. This correlation is pretty strong. So theoretically this random effect might not actually be doing that much for me um, um, because it's already largely determined by the linear random effect. But let's actually test that question and see empirically which of these things is the better model, which we'll get to in a second. So that correlation is pretty high but it wasn't high enough that you know the math broke and we got a warning. 
Uh, so let's keep moving forward with interpreting this model. And you know, again, the other thing we want to look at in this table are the residuals, which have gone down by quite a bit now. So by including the quadratic fixed effect and the quadratic random effect, on average, we're only three points away with our predictions, right? So our, our, our regression lines are actually a pretty good approximation of each person's data. Uh, and our residuals have gotten a lot smaller from when we started. And if we actually want to see what our model is predicting, right, again, we can look at the fixed effects to get the intercept to get the effect of time and to get the quadratic effect of time. Uh, and we could actually you know, use these coefficients in the equation to figure out, well, what's the actual predicted value of y at any one point? Uh, but the main thing is, you know, here are our effects uh, and we can look at the statistical significance of these effects. And again, because we've included random effects for all three of these parameters, their degrees of freedom are all around 40 because we're saying in essence, okay, well, we've got you know, about 40 intercepts, 40 slopes and 40 quadratic slopes. Um, so we're estimating those things within each person and then saying, okay, let's pool all the quadratic effects together, see what the group level effect is uh, and how much deviation there is left over after that. So to see that model in a little more detail again, right? we can gloss over the actual R code, but I'm pulling out the coefficients from each model to plot the quadratic effect for each person. Uh, and you can see that this is quite a good approximation of our data for most of these people. Everyone differs in both their intercepts, they differ in the tilt of their individual lines, right, being the linear component, and they also differ in the curvature of their lines, being the quadratic component. Um, so the, you can see kind of what our model is doing when we estimate those random effects for each person. And then on average across people, right, we can always just come back up to our fixed effects to say, okay, so this was the intercept, you know, approximately uh, at time zero, people have a Roche scaled FIM score of about 18 points. You know, the initial slope is about 64 points. However, that slope actually gets less positive over time uh, because we have a negative quadratic effect. And in fact, it starts to bend downward. So this is consistent with improvement that shows diminishing returns because the initial slope is quite steep, but it gets less and less steep as time moves on until we actually get to a point that for some of these individuals, it would hypothetically bend down. Um, and that's, that's a problem we can definitely talk about uh, uh, later because you know they probably don't really bend down, they flatten. So the quadratic slope might be a good approximation within the window of time we're looking at, but we don't want to extrapolate beyond the data that we have because then now your quadratic function is going to be forcing your predictions to curve down even though that's probably not really what happens once you move outside of your data. So let's take a break there for just a second though. Feel free to you know, go back and rewatch anything or make some notes on things that are confusing. Um, and once, but now that we have all of these random effects models, we want to talk about how do we compare between these different models. All right. So again, you can read through the output for a little more detail uh, on, on some of these things um, and get a little more background on some of the calculations that are being done. Um, but I wanna focus in on just a few key conceptual points in, in this workshop, and then we can talk through some things in the Zoom Q&A. But much like in traditional regression, where you're gonna use the sum of squared errors in order to make a decision about is something a statistically significant addition, right? You know, Does it explain enough error that we think that that is unlikely to be due to sampling variability, uh, we're going to have a metric of error um, from maximum likelihood estimation called the deviance. It is essentially the, the, the conceptual equivalent of the sum of squared errors. And our goal is going to be to reduce the deviance and get a model that is a better fit to our data. And now the deviance is negative two times the likelihood. Um, and the uh, likelihood is a little bit confusing um, but uh, if you write it out, this is what that formula would ultimately turn into. Um, and this is a little bit intimidating, I think, as a formula to look at, depending on your background in mathematics. But there are a couple things that I want to impress upon you uh, when we're looking at this. First, notice that the deviance is likely largely still being determined by the sum of errors. So all else being equal, if we have smaller errors, we're going to have a smaller deviance. Um, and our, that, that, that is desirable because if we have smaller errors, that means our model is a better um, explanation of the data. Second, 
you'll notice that the sample size actually kind of comes in two different places here. We have the n for the number of observations, and then we're summing over the errors for each observation. So essentially, the more observations that we have, the, we'll have an error for each one, right? So the, the, the more observations that we have, the larger that sum is going to become. And this means that the calculation of the deviance is sensitive to the amount of data that you have. Uh, so the, 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 the big picture take home from this is that we can only compare the deviance fairly from models that are based on exactly the same data. If you had one data set that was bigger, it's, it's potentially gonna have a bigger deviance just by chance. Um, so we can only fairly compare models that come from the same data set. Um, and we can then fit different models to that data and decide which one is better. But if, you know, if we added a covariate and there were some missing values and therefore we had to drop people, now we can't fairly compare those models anymore because one is fundamentally based on less data than the other model. So that's one thing to keep in mind moving forward is that we have to compare models based on the same amount of data. Now, fortunately, in our hypothetical example, it's kind of a toy data set where we have complete data. Uh, so, so no one gets dropped. In all cases, we had or 720 observations and 40 individuals. Uh, but So what we can do now is decide, well, which of our unconditional models, right, where our models where we're just looking at the effect of time is actually the best approximation of our data. And we can compare the random intercepts to the fixed slopes, to the random slopes, to the quadratic random slopes. Uh, and we can do that using the ANOVA function in R. So we'll do you say ANOVA, uh, and then we'll enter in our different models. Um, and we'll, we'll, we will enter them in the order we want them to be tested. So we'll start with our simplest, put the random intercepts first, then the uh, random intercept fixed slope, then the random linear slope, then the random quadratic slope. And we're gonna get an ANOVA table that looks like this. Um, and you can scroll through the, the worksheet for a more detailed description of what some of these columns are um, and, and you know, what this chi-square test ultimately is, uh, what the uh, chi-k's information criterion ultimately is. Uh, but the thing that I really want you to focus on is that we have two different ways primarily of assessing model fit here. One is Wald's test of the change in deviance. So it looks at the difference in the deviance between successive models uh, and calculates that based on a chi-square distribution. So these two models are 945 points different in the deviance, and that's a big change in the deviance. Uh, and that happens to be statistically significant based on, a, on the chi-square test. Similarly, these two models are 131 points different, right? And that is a statistically significant improvement based on the chi-square test of the change in deviance. Our final model, that quadratic random slopes model, is a 763 point improvement above the linear model. And that is a statistically significant improvement above the linear test of the change in deviance. So with each successive model, we're getting a better and better explanation of the data. However, one of the issues with the walled chi-squared test um, is that it is just looking at the change in the deviance. Um, and so it is, seeking out essentially the model that explains the data that are right in front of you right now, you know, and, and which model is the best explanation of those specific data. However, one of the problems that we face is that we want our models to generalize to new data sets. So we're, it's not always just, is this the best explanation of the data that are in front of me right now? It's a question of, is this model gonna be the best explanation of a new sample of data? Or if someone else went and collected this sample you know, from the same population and tested similar models, would they get the same answer? So the statistic that we'll actually prefer is the Akaike's information criterion or the AIC. Uh, and the AIC is shown in this column here. Uh, and the AIC introduces a penalty based on the a number of additional parameters that you have in your model. So the goal of this is to reduce something that's known as overfitting. Uh, and the idea behind overfitting is that you, as you add parameters, you might be explaining the data in front of you very well, um, but it's not going to explain a new set of data very well. Uh, and, and we can talk about some concrete examples of this in the Zoom session if you're not familiar with that term. But in order to avoid overfitting, the Akaike's information criterion introduces a penalty based on the number of parameters. So you can see as a starting point, um, our Akaike's information criterion is a little bit higher than the deviance uh, because we only have three parameters. 
Uh, and then, then down at the end, you can see that our Akaike's information criterion is actually about 20 points higher than the deviance uh, because we have 10 parameters. So it, for every additional parameter, the AIC is imposing a penalty on the deviance. Uh, and what we want to see then is, is the model fit a reduction above and beyond that penalty. And in this case, it still is because our AIC is always going down. And that's what you're looking for when you're looking at the, that AIC column. Which of those is the lowest value? Because that's going to tell you the model that is the best explanation of the data while taking into consideration that penalty to avoid overfitting. So, so you, know, you might think about the deviance as sort of being the best explanation from the sense of errors. The AIC is the most parsimonious explanation. It tells you which one is giving you the best model fit as a, versus its complexity, right? So that's why I talk about the AIC being a measure of parsimony. For a given level of complexity, it's giving you the best model fit. And if your model is starting to be more complicated than it is fit, uh, your AIC is gonna go up. So in this case though, every model is a successive improvement above the other one because the AIC keeps going down. And therefore we'd make the same decision regardless of we, if we use the walled test of the change of deviance or if we use the AIC. Uh, we're going to go with the quadratic random slopes model as our best fitting model. So again, there is some additional information uh, in, in those sections, you know, to kind of talk through the AIC and talk through the walled change in deviance uh, and some additional information in that handout um, um, if, you're, if you're really interested in that. But for now, I'm actually going to move on to the second uh, practical session handout. So that's practical session two, conditional models and hypothesis testing where we're gonna build on that model we just created. Uh, so in the unconditional model, we were trying to decide what is the best shape of the time curve. Now in the conditional model, we're trying to decide, well, what actually makes a difference in how people change over time? So this is where we're gonna add in a factor of AIS grade and try to decide, do our groups of participants change differently over time? All right, so again, if you're following along with this in R, you can you know, copy and paste the code uh, into your own script, or you could um, you know, open up the, the R markdown documents that have been given to you and run these individual code chunks for the ones that go with ACRM session two. Um, so you, know, you can follow along with those R code chunks um, or running the R code on your own, depending on how comfortable with that you are. But I'm gonna focus primarily on the interpretation in the worksheet. Uh, and then we can save any Zoom tr or troubleshooting of, of our problems for the Zoom Q&A uh, a little later on. So let's go ahead and um, scroll down just a little bit here, because the first part of this is, again, just kind of opening up the data and getting a reminder of what these data are. So uh, after importing the data, I have this ggplot code where we're going to be looking at Roche scaled FIM scores over time in this hypothetical data set. And what we want to see now is if people change differently as a function of the severity of their injury. So we had several people who had a C1 to 4 injury, several people who had a C5 to 8 injury, and several people who had paraplegia. Uh, and we want to look at, do these groups differ in their change over time? In the previous practical session, we established the best way to capture change over time was with a quadratic random effects model. Uh, and now what we're going to do is say, given that model, do these groups differ in terms of their intercepts, their linear slopes, and their quadratic slopes? In the unconditional model, we determined that it was those three parameters that really made the difference. So now we can add a fixed effect of group to help us decide, well, do the C1 to 4s start in a different place than the C5 to 8s? Or do the C1 to 4s have a different rate of change than the C5 to 8s? Uh, all right. And by exploring how your group affects your trajectory, we can answer so we can test some hypotheses and hopefully answer some relevant scientific questions about how the severity of your injury relates to your initial impairment and relates to your change over time. So that's what we're going to ultimately try to decide. Right. And in this spaghetti plot, we're looking at the individual trajectories for people shown in gray and the group level trajectories shown in black. And in this case, I'm plotting just the moving average uh, for each of those groups. So in order to create the conditional model, 
Um, we're going to, uh, uh, again, have our, our year.0 variable um, where we've converted months into years and we've centered time on the first available uh, data point. And we're just gonna start by refitting that quadratic random effects model. Um, so you know, if you have the same R session open, it's probably already there in your environment. But if you've stopped after session one and you're starting session two, we want to recreate this model because from the unconditional models, this was the best fitting model that we had. Uh, and so we're gonna use this as our benchmark to see, okay, does adding an effective group actually make a difference above and beyond just time on average, ignoring what group you were in. So we're going to create that model. Again, we're going to have fixed effects of the intercept, the linear effect of time, and the quadratic effect of time. And then we're going to have random effects for the intercept, the linear effect of time, and the quadratic effect of time within each subject. Uh, and if we want to see, you know, okay, well, how just what do these things explain? We can use the ANOVA function also to look at a single model. Uh, and in this case, we're going to get the type three analysis of variance table. Uh, and, and I talk about this a little bit in the text. Hopefully you're familiar with the notion of type three sums of squared errors calculations versus type two and type one. Um, if you're not, I would encourage you to revisit some of that content. Uh, um, you know, I can direct you to some videos or regression textbooks that talk about how those things are calculated uh, differently. Um, but the one thing I would always impress upon you is be careful if you're looking at a type one analysis of variance table versus a type three analysis of variance table, because that's going to have a, a, a massive effect on how you interpret the variables in your model. In our case, um, because we're using LME4 and we've loaded the LMER test package, uh, it is going to be giving us type three tables. If you don't have both of those packages loaded, you might be getting type one tables. Uh, and therefore, it's going to be really important both for walking through this handout and in future sessions, if you're ever building your own models, to look at that and say, OK, is, am, I, am I getting a type one table or am I getting a type three table? Uh, because the interpretation is going to be very different. So knowing that we're getting type three tables, right, the, 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 what we can interpret these as sort of traditional main effects and interactions that you might get from, a, from an ANOVA output. Um, and we can get omnibus tests if we use that ANOVA function. If we want to actually look at individual coefficients, we can now use the summary function like we've done before, right? And again, it'll tell us our model fit statistics. It'll give us a description of the residuals. It'll give us the random effects. And then it will actually give us the coefficients and, uh, uh, that we estimate uh, in the fixed effects. And you can say, okay, on average across all people, ignoring what group you're in, here is our intercept, here is our linear slope, and here is our quadratic slope. Again, capturing that idea uh, that if we want to describe how Y is changing over time, people start at a value of about 18 points, and their initial slope is six, about 64 uh, points, right? That's the initial linear slope, but that slope becomes less positive over time, right? And it actually starts to flatten out as time goes on. So if we actually wanted to solve for a specific value of Y, we could pull out those coefficients, plug in different values of X, and actually solve for what the predicted Roche scaled FIM score is at any given time. However, our goal at the start of this, right, was not just to get the overall slopes and intercepts, it's to see how the groups actually differed from each other. And to do that, we're going to add a fixed effect of AIS grade to our model uh, in order to see how do the groups differ. So in R, I'm gonna create an object called conditional model one. And again, we'll be using LMER to get our Roche scaled FIM scores. Um, and then we're going to add a fixed effect of AIS grade. Uh, and we're gonna have AIS grade interact with both uh, time and the quadratic effect of time. Uh, and as I explained in the text up here, we're gonna use this asterisk operator. Uh, and the reason for doing that is if you use the asterisk, uh, to say like year.0 by AIS grade, R is smart enough to know you want both the main effects and the interactions of those terms. Um, so if you have higher order interactions, that can be especially helpful because you can just say variable one, asterisk variable two, asterisk variable three, and it will give you the fully factorial design. It'll give you all the main effects and the interactions. Alternatively, if you wanted to specify things by hand, Right? You could also say, okay, well, I want the main effect of time, 
I want the main effect of AIS grade, and I want the interaction between year or between time and AIS grade using the colon operator. So the asterisk operator gives you main effects and interactions. The colon operator gives you a single interaction by itself. Um, and so those would be equally valid ways of kind of writing the same formula, uh, but to save on space. And because we want the fully factorial design, I'm just gonna use the asterisk here when I input my fixed effects. Now the random effects will stay the same, right? Because I have time that varies within subjects. AIS grade does not vary within subjects. If you, if you had a C1 to four injury at the beginning of the experiment, you had a C1 to four injury the whole time, right? That is a subject level variable. So it does not vary within subjects. So I don't need to worry about making my random effects any different here when I'm adding that variable to the model. So AIS grade just goes in the fixed effects. Our random effects stay the same as they always have. Once I have that model, right, I can run that code in R to create the model object. And then I can analyze that, that model using the ANOVA function. Uh, and that will give us, again, a type three analysis of variance table uh, where it shows us the main effect of time, which is statistically significant, the main effect of AIS grade, which is statistically significant, uh, and the main effect of time squared, which is also statistically significant. So that suggests that people are changing over time. Uh, their rate of change right, also changes over time. And there are some differences on average between the, the, the groups. However, we don't actually see a statistically significant time by group interaction, nor do we see a time by group squared interaction. So that suggests that although you know, we have some initial differences in those groups and we have some with higher intercepts and some with lower intercepts, the trajectory for these groups right, is not reliably different. Um, Individuals with paraplegia, right, have a higher intercept than individuals with C5 to 8, have a higher intercept than individuals with C1 to 4 injury. Um, all of them change over time, but there's not a significant time by group interaction, nor a quadratic time by group interaction. So that suggests the tilt of their lines and the curvature of their lines is, are all about the same. Uh, and most of the differences in our groups are actually due to these starting points at, at, at the intercept. So if we want to unpack those um, omnibus main effects and interactions properly though, right? for instance, the effect of AIS grade has two degrees of freedom, what we would need to do is actually conduct some post hoc tests or use the summary function to look at the individual coefficients. Uh, and this makes the, 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 the model output a lot more complicated um, because you can see that now we have a whole bunch of coefficients. When we've added in that main effect of group and we've added in the interactions with group and time, now we have a much bigger model and we have a lot more detail that we have to worry about and unpack. Um, so to give a quick overview of what this actually means, right, and how to interpret this output, it's important to remember that R uses uh, what we would call dummy coding or treatment coding, where it takes a reference group and it codes that group as zero across all levels of the categorical variables. And then the group it's getting compared to uh, gets coded as one. So the way we can interpret that then is that anything that doesn't have an AIS grade variable or AIS grade name in the variable name is referring to the C1 to four group because that is the alphabetically first group. And therefore it is what R will treat as the reference group. So for the intercept, right, doesn't have an AIS grade effect in it, uh, that 12.28, that is the intercept for the C1 to 4 group. Similarly, the effect of time with year zero, it doesn't have AIS grade in the name, that is the effect of time in the C1 to 4 group. And finally, I, the, the, the effect of time squared, right, negative 24.86, that is the quadratic effect of time in the C1 to four group. All of these other coefficients are showing the difference between the named group and the reference group. So for AIS grade C5 to eight, that's telling us about the difference in the intercept between the C5 to eight group and the C1 to four group. So the C1 to four has had an intercept of 12.28. The intercept for the C5 to eights was 6.8 points higher. 
Similarly, for AIS grade paraplegia, that's telling us the difference between the, the intercept for the C1 to 4s and the paraplegic group, who had an intercept that was 14.6 points higher. Um, so that can be a little hard to unpack, um, but if you're familiar with treatment coding, uh, hopefully that makes sense to you. If you're newer to treatment coding, I would encourage you to go through this section 2.3, Unpacking the Conditional Model, where I show you how to take each of those individual coefficients, right, and then plug in ones or zeros, depending on how it is coded, in order to simplify the model. Uh, and although there is kind of a lot of math here, it's all very simple. You're just plugging in ones and zeros and then reducing the equations. Um, and then ultimately, right, what you get down to are these three equations here. Wrapped up in our larger model, we can see, okay, here is what the equation actually reduces to for the C1 to 4 group. Here is what the equation then gets modified to for the C5 to 8 group. And here is what the equation gets modified to uh, for the paraplegic group. And we can see some of the, the differences from our ANOVA table represented in these three equations. There was a main effect of time, right? So all groups improved over time. All of their linear slopes are statistically different from zero. And that seems to check out because uh, they all have quite large positive slopes. There was also a statistically significant quadratic effect of time, right? Such that all groups uh, uh, show, or, or I should say, on average across groups, there was uh, a negative uh, curvature to the trajectory. Um, now, th these things did get modified by the effect of AIS grade. There was a main effect of AIS grade, which shows the effect of group on the intercept. And we can see that in the intercepts of these three different equations. Right, the, we have a higher intercept for the C5 to 8 group than we do the C1 to 4s, and we have a higher intercept for the paraplegic group than we do the C1 to 4s. So we see some group differences in the intercept, and that kind of checks out as we look at these models because those intercepts do look quite different from each other. Now, we did not see a statistically significant group by linear time interaction, suggesting that although in the sample these linear trajectories are all different, they aren't actually statistically different from each other. So we did not find evidence in this model that your uh, linear trajectory changed as a function of group. Similarly, we did not find evidence of a group by uh, quadratic uh, time interaction, suggesting that our quadratic trajectories were not reliably different across the different groups. Um, so again, I hope that feels a little bit familiar to you if you've worked with dummy coding in regression before. Um, if you haven't, I'd encourage you to maybe rewatch this section and then spend some time working through that section of the, the video. Um, also, depending on how familiar you are with omnibus tests and the notion of conducting an omnibus F test and then doing a follow-up post hoc test, uh, I'd encourage you to spend a little bit more time uh, looking at section 2.4 and how we can use the ANOVA function and the summary function to ultimately get the omnibus tests with the ANOVA function and then get at least some of the post hoc tests we might be interested in with the summary function. So I hope this additional explanation is helpful to you as you work through these handouts and as you run through the R code. If you have any questions about anything in the handouts, anything conceptually, and especially any errors that came up as you're trying to troubleshoot the R, R uh, code, uh, please bring those to our Zoom Q&A uh, and Al and I will be available to help you. Uh, thank you very much and I look forward to seeing you in the next part of the course.